Okay, let's resume then. Next speaker is Doug Farenik from University of Regina, and he's going to tell us about isometric and contractive panels relative to the Beer's metric. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. okay. I thought I heard an echo, but I guess I was imagining it. Right, now I hear an echo. Um, yeah, so uh, two former students, Sam and Misa, who are now uh, at the University of Waterloo. Um, so I'd like to start off by uh, discussing fidelity and how that leads into a concept that is probably well known to um, many people here, the Beerus metric, and then um, how those ideas relate to quantum channels. So the notion of uh, fidelity originates in classical communication theory, and um, it's, it's just a, a a notion um, to determine how close one state is to another. And um, for pure states, uh, represented as unit vectors in a Hilbert space, we measure the fidelity by the modulus of the inner product of the two vectors. And uh, you think of one of the vectors as being a reference vector, and high fidelity occurs when the numerical measure is close to one, and at exactly one, the vectors are identical up to a phase factor. And then low fidelity occurs when that numerical measure is close to zero, and at exactly zero, those, uh, those uh, vectors are orthogonal. Uh, of course, that's, that's uh, classical and defined for uh, pure states. Um, uh, building on the work of Beerus and Ullmann, uh, Josa, in 1994 defined a notion of fidelity for mixed states. So um, this is in the context really of density matrices or, or trace class <coughs> operators. Um, and so the fidelity of two states sigma and rho is defined to be the trace of the modulus of the positive square root of sigma times the positive square root of rho. And um, if you let sigma and rho be the, the rank one density operators uh, affiliated with two unit vectors, then uh, the fidelity formula of JOSA captures the, the classical fidelity formula. And um, through uh, body of work, uh, what's uh, shown is that the fidelity using JOSA's definition um, is bounded between zero and one, and again, at exactly one, we get that the states are, are identical, and at exactly zero, the states are orthogonal in the sense that the product is zero. Okay, now fidelity is, is, a, is a, a concept measuring how close one state is to another, but it's not really a metric in the mathematical sense of the definition. Um, uh, so, uh, oops. Uh, we have a different formula here. Um, so we take one minus the fidelity and then the square root, and that's called uh, the Beerus metric. And it's actually, in fact, uh, not a trivial um, exercise to prove that it is a metric, although it is an exercise in uh, Hayashi's book on quantum information theory, but um, an exercise in the se sense that the steps are laid out. And I'd like to just point out uh, two elements of the proof. Um, there's some interesting tracial operator inequalities involved, and um, the use of the polar decomposition is, is a requirement. All right, uh, and again, as I said, this is called the Beerus metric. So uh, what Sam and Misa and I were interested in doing is um, just looking at kind of like the algebraic uh, ideas that underlie the notion of fidelity and later on some, a, a particular result of Molnar that we are aware of concerning um, channels. So uh, what we'd like to do is um, put all of this into a C-star algebraic framework. So for the rest of the talk, A is going to denote a unital C-star algebra. Uh, uh, tau will denote a fixed faithful 
tracial positive linear functional, so we don't always require that the trace of the identity be one, can be uh, something else. Um, and then with that fixed trace, uh, we can look at the corresponding density elements, and those would be the positive elements of A of trace one. And if it so happens that A is a, a finite von Neumann algebra, then um, uh, we'll assume that the trace is also normal. So that'll be uh, the running assumption. And uh, so I'd just uh, like to tie this back to the lecture we heard yesterday from uh, Reinhard Werner, where we had um, Alice and Bob in infinity. And uh, so just a couple of examples um, to keep in mind, and this was uh, one example that was mentioned yesterday. Uh, so we have the uh, infinite tensor product of the two by two matrices, uh, which can be viewed as the, the completion or closure of uh, an ascending union of finite dimensional matrix algebras, two n by two n matrices. Um, comes equipped with a trace, and when we uh, restrict to one of these a n, we get the normalized trace on the matrices. So in some sense, the, um, the trace here is unique if it's normalized, and um, the corresponding density space somehow contains all of the, the 2n by 2n density matrices. So that's one type of example. Uh, another one in the von Neumann algebra category is we'll take that same algebra, uh, do the GNS decomposition of the trace, um, and that will represent A as a unital C star subalgebra of some B of H for a separable Hilbert space H. And take the double commutant of that, um, the, the trace on uh, A extends to a trace on the double commutant N, and, um, and this is a known, well-known uh, construction of the hyperfinite to one factor. And then my third example is a little different uh, because uh, later on in the talk I'll uh, get some motivation from uh, the theory of non-negative matrices. So, <laughs> Uh, we'll let A be a finite dimensional C star algebra of dimension D. So, um, of course, we can think of that as D tuples of complex numbers. The positive cone is the, um, the, the vectors with non-negative non entries. And thus, uh, and the multiplicative identity is just the all ones vector, and the trace is simply summing up the entries in the vector. So the density space is a classical D simplex in RD. Okay, um, now the fidelity is defined by the trace on a C star algebra, so we need to have some uh, tools to do analysis with traces. And um, uh, it's, it's not, I mean, even if we're doing matrix theory, we're often using um, the eigenvalues of matrices when we're studying uh, inequalities involving traces of positive uh, matrices. So, uh, what we'll do here is uh, we won't carry out our analysis in the C star algebra category, but we'll actually work in a von Neumann algebra. Uh, so, and in that setting, we have a natural notion uh, of uh, singular value or singular number. So, just as a reminder or, or as an introduction, if you haven't seen it before, um, if we have an element x in a finite von Neumann algebra and, and the tr you know, we have our trace tau, um, then the teeth singular number for t uh, real number t greater than or equal to zero will be defined to be the, uh, this quantity here. It's the infimum of the norms of x e, where we allow e to range through uh, projections in n whose the trace of the complement is less than or equal to t. So if you take t equals zero, for example, what you capture here is uh, the e should be equal to the identity, and so you capture the norm. So it's, in the matrix case, the largest singular value is the norm of the operator. And then uh, just as an example of what we get with a projection, um, if f is a projection, uh, the singular number is one whenever t is strictly less than the trace of the projection, and it's zero uh, for all other t. Okay, and then in, uh, if you apply this definition to matrices, you actually just cap recapture the, the classical singular values. Um, so uh, the, the formula on the previous page somehow measures distance to operators of a certain uh, 
rank, you could say, or generalized rank, and that's exactly what we have in the matrix case. And um, we know that the trace norm of a matrix is given by the trace of its modulus, so that's the sum of the singular values. And in this setting, we can actually write it as an integral. I mean, this is kind of a, a trivial way to write this, or a silly way to write this, but in fact, I wrote it that way because it's a theorem. Uh, so, uh, you can always express the trace, trace norm of an element in a finite von Neumann algebra as the integral um, over the interval from zero to the trace of the identity of the singular numbers of the operator. Okay, so that'll be one of our main tools. And um, uh, so, uh, because we'll have to do things to establish that the Beer's metric is a metric, we'll need some, uh, like a triangle inequality. This will all take place by looking at um, uh, inequalities between singular numbers. And to that end, um, uh, we'll make use of a theorem I proved uh, with a, another graduate student, uh, Mahmoud Manjagani, uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and it's a, it's a singular value version of, um, of Young's inequality. And I should mention, uh, since there's colleagues here from Japan, that it's actually inspired by an original theorem in matrices by Ando. Um, okay, and what it says is if we have conjugate indices P and Q, um, so 1 over P plus 1 over Q adds up to, the, up to 1, um, and if we take two elements in the von Neumann algebra N, then for every T greater than or equal to 0, the t singular number of the modulus of x, y star is bounded above by the sum of the uh, singular, or sorry, it's the, the singular number of the, of the operator 1 over p x modulus x to the p plus 1 over q modulus x to the q. So that's the inequality, um, and then uh, most importantly for what will transpire here is that the case of equality is uh, also determined. So you have equality for all singular numbers if and only if the modulus of y to the qth power equals the modulus of p to the x to the pth power. And um, in our setting, we'll be interested in the case where p and q are equal to 2. But it does allow for the analysis of um, equality in the uh, tracial Hilder and Young inequalities. And when you apply it to positive operators, that's essentially when b to the q is equal to a to the q. Okay, so that leads to the first theorem, which uh, says that the Beerus metric is indeed a metric. And um, its values are all uh, contained in the interval between 0 and 1. And um, if you happen to be at maximal distance from it, uh, between two of these density elements, then the, the operators have to be, or the elements of the C star algebra have to be uh, orthogonal in the sense that their product is zero. And the proof is to not do the proof in the C star algebra, but use the von Neumann algebra by doing the GS, GNS decomp decomposition on the trace, do the tracial analysis. Um, ex we do need to exploit the uh, polar decomposition as well, and then you pull back to A when it's all done. Okay, now, um, so that's the Beerus metric, and now we'll consider that density space as a, a, a metric space. And then um, we'll now consider channels, and so a linear map phi of A back into itself uh, will be called a channel if it takes the density space back into the density space. So uh, by virtue of that, the map phi is positive, um, and it's trace preserving. And if it so happens to satisfy a uh, Schwartz inequality, um, phi of x star, phi of x less than or equal to phi of xx star for every x in the algebra, then necessarily the, the map is unital. And if A is in a, a finite von Neumann algebra, then we'll also require, when we use the word channel, we'll require that um, an additional condition in that is that phi be uh, normal. Okay, so I'd like to point out one, uh, one thing here in my terminology. Using the word channel, I'm not assuming complete positivity. I'm only assuming positivity. 
That's a bit of a difference. Um, but uh, we, heard, we heard on Monday about a little bit about the Schwartz inequality. And uh, often, well, in fact, in, in nearly all of the results we have, this level of positivity is sufficient to get the kinds of results that we need. Okay, and I uh, just, uh, just want to point out again that if we're talking about uh, the, the finite dimensional C star algebra, then, then the channel, um, what well, would of course be a linear map with non negative, or matrix with non negative entries, and a channel corresponds to a non negative column stochastic matrix, and a unital channel would be a, a doubly stochastic matrix. Okay. Um, this is our second main result, and it might be the, uh, the hardest result of all the ones we've, I'll, I'll present today. Um, and what it says is that if you have a, a channel on, on A, and you restrict it to the density space, then it's a non-expansive expansive map. So uh, the distance between um, uh, uh, two states is greater than or equal to the distance of the images of those states under the channel phi. And uh, because of this theorem, we can consider channels of two types. One will be the isometric ones, so it preserves the distance of all pairs of states. And then the other will be the contractive ones, where we uh, strictly decrease the distance if we have distinct <coughs> states. Okay, so the first type of, uh, of um, channel in that category I call a, uh, a Burris isometry. So those are the, the channels on A that preserve the distances between, the Burris distance between any two states. And the following theorem of Molnar was in fact the, the theorem that got, got us thinking about this whole line of work in the first place. And Molnar proved that in the case of um, the matrix algebra with a canonical trace, a channel is a Beerus isometry if and only if it's a, an automorphism or a unitary channel or um, unitary channel composed with the, with the transpose. So that was a very nice result. Um, he uh, proved um, later on that uh, you could do this exact same thing by assuming phi is merely a function, so he assumed no linearity on phi and arrived at the same conclusion. Okay, so, um, so I wanted to, uh, let's see, do I have the question there? Yes, so the question is, what channels are um, Beerus isometric, and if you, if you can't decide what channels actually are, what are some of the properties? So, um, because you're, we're only assuming positivity rather than, you know, complete positivity, there's a limit to what kind of things you may be able to infer about um, an is isometric map. But um, uh, if you have an isometry, then it's necessarily injective. Um, and if it happens to be a surjective, then it's an order isomorphism, so its inverse is also positive. And um, we have uh, Cattison's inequality, so uh, this is known for all unital positive linear maps that, that when you apply it to self-adjoint elements, um, it maps uh, the square of that element to something larger than the square of what it maps to. And, uh, and if you do happen to have a unital surjective Beerus isometry, then you get equality in all the cases of Cattison's inequality. So uh, it's sort of like a Jordan homomorphism. Um, it pr they present some level of, multipl some level of uh, multiplicative structure. So that's one property. Uh, another property has to do with uh, orthogonality. So um, two elements, x and y, in a C star algebra are said to be orthogonal if if all those pairs of products listed there um, are zero, and then we say that a map, a linear map of A has order zero if it takes orthogonal pairs to orthogonal pairs. And it just so happens that if, if you're working with positive linear maps that happen to satisfy the Schwartz inequality I mentioned earlier, uh, 
then it's enough to check the orthogonality condition on positive elements. And uh, so this is a property of um, uh, Schwartz channels. So by that I mean a channel that satisfies the Schwartz inequality um, that happens to be pure isometric. They take um, their maps of order zero. Okay, so uh, here's one, our third major theorem. Um, if you have a finite prime C star algebra, so finite means that if X times Y is the identity, then so is Y times X. Prime means that the uh, product of any two ideals is zero only if one of those two ideals is uh, zero. Then a surjective Schwartz channel is necessarily an automorphism of the algebra. So highly multiplicative. And then that recovers uh, at least the, um, uh, 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 one of the parts of Molnar's theorem. And, um, and then as a second example, if you happen to have a finite factor, which was a finite prime C source algebra, then you get the same, same result. So, and our second major theorem about uh, isometric Burroughs channels is that, um, and here we need to assume complete positivity, if you have a completely positive uh, Burris isometric channel, then um, it's almost like a homomorphism, but uh, uh, you, there's an element in the center of trace uh, equal to the trace of the identity, such that um, it's, uh, the channel is really a homomorphism times this multiplication operator. Okay, so those are the... Uh, I guess if I just go back, uh, if you have trivial center, then, this, uh, then, then you have a, uh, a true homomorphism. So that's uh, what we learned about the structure of isometries, and now I'd like to just say a few words about the structure of uh, contractions. Um, so first, uh, just a recollection of the definition. If we have two distinct density elements, then we ask that phi take, uh, that strictly reduce the distance of those elements. Um, and I'll just make a small remark here that uh, um, my use of the word contraction wouldn't coincide uh, precisely with the use of the word in um, the usual study of, of maps on metric spaces uh, because we're not, def the, we're not uh, assuming that there's some uniform constant here. Um, now, there's lots of examples of, of um, contractive channels. In fact, they're norm dense in the space of all channels. Uh, so uh, a depolarizing channel is one example. And once you have one example, then you can produce other examples by taking convex combinations in which only one of those maps is Beerus contractive. Okay. So uh, the previous section showed that uh, Schwartz channels that are Burris isometric um, have sort of multiplicative behavior. We expect the opposite thing to happen with um, contractive channels, and indeed that's the case. Oops. Uh, uh, if you have a, uh, a contractive Schwartz channel, then its multiplicative domain is the smallest possible, and namely uh, uh, scalar multiples of the identity. And uh, once again, as we heard on Monday, the multiplicative domain is the largest C star subalgebra of A on which the uh, positive map acts as a homomorphism. So it basically has no multiplicativity behind it. Um, now, uh, <clears throat> there's, there's a number of things you can say about uh, contractivity, but I'd like to, to mention two things uh, before I finish. And that ha connects um, the theory of positive maps with um, Frobenius theory. And, and uh, there's two types of Frobenius theory, one that has to do with um, properties of how a, uh, a linear transformation maps a cone back into itself, and the other is related to spectral theory. So I'd like to just mention the two here. So first we'll do the cone theory. Um, and uh, so we'll say that a, a a channel, well actually these are defined for linear maps, so a linear map, a positive linear, op, linear map on A uh, is reducible if it leaves a non-trivial norm-closed 
face of the positive cone of A invariant. And if we do the same thing in a von Neumann algebra and ask that our positive map be normal, then we ask that it, um, it be, we say that it's reducible if it leaves a, a non-trivial, ultra-weakly closed face of the cone invariant. And if the maps are not reducible, they're called irreducible. So two uh, examples of irreducible maps. One, the first one is inspired by matrix theory, uh, theory of non-negative matrices. Um, so as we saw, those, uh, a positive linear map in that setting would be a matrix with non-negative elements. Um, you can look at the graph associated with that, the directed adjacency matrix associated with that. So you'd have an arrow from node I to node J if the IJ entry of that matrix is non-zero. And then it's uh, irreducible um, if uh, between any two nodes in the graph there's a directed path joining them. Uh, and then there's another way to uh, look at irreducibility for decomposable maps on the D by D matrices, and it has to do with the um, uh, uh, lack of common invariant subspaces among the, the Krauss operators. Okay. Um, and there's a nice uh, sort of dichotomy here that doesn't appear with matrices. Um, so just recall that if we take a positive linear map, phi on A back into itself. Um, and then if we look at the envel enveloping von Neumann algebra, A double star of A, then, then we get a map phi double star that takes its A star back into itself that's positive and normal. And it turns out that uh, if you have a positive linear map on a C star algebra, the irreducibility of that map uh, in the C star algebra category is equivalent to the irreducibili irreducibility of the map in the von Neumann algebra category. And uh, the fifth result to communicate is um, in the two categories, uh, Beerus, Contractive, Schwartz, Channels are irreducible maps. Okay, and I'll turn now and, and finish with the spectral theory. Um, and again, this is partly motivated by uh, classical no theory of non-negative matrices where we have the so-called uh, perron frobenius theorem. And Perron's theorem really says that the spectral radius of a non-negative matrix is an eigenvalue. And the Frobenius part has to do with irreducible non-negative matrices, um, which comes to the same conclusion. But the Frobenius theory actually has a little bit more information about um, what we would call the peripheral eigenvalues of the matrix. Um, that theory extends to, to you know, positive linear maps of all type and, and in particular um, in our setting to positive linear maps on C-star algebras. Uh, so uh, the theorem I'd like to uh, point out here is that of GROW. If you have an irreducible unital channel, um, then any eigenvalues, so the spectrum is going to be contained in the closed unit disk, any eigenvalues of, the, of phi that appear on the boundary of the disk, um, that set will form a multiplicative group, and if it's finite, it's a cyclic group. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's, uh, we can show that if you take a contractive Schwartz channel, then that group is going to have to be the trivial group. And so uh, the question uh, that we uh, raised that is, because you have this, is it at all possible that the um, peripheral spectrum itself, not just the eigenvalues, but the entire spectrum, intersects the, uh, can only have one as a peripheral spectral element? And um, I couldn't find that addressed in the literature anywhere. Uh, so uh, this is our last result. There exists a Beerus contractive Schwartz channel, phi, um, such that its uh, point spectrum is dense in the open unit disk, and, and thus its spectrum is a closed unit disk. So in this case, the peripheral spectrum of phi is the entire circle, although the point spectrum intersecting the circle will only be at the number one. Uh, just a, a final remark here. Um, what I've talked about 
if you wanted to use the types of yesterday's lecture is uh, in, in, in the von Neumann algebra case, it would be in the type you know, 1D or 2-1 uh, case. Uh, we've done similar sorts of analysis in the type 1 infinity and 2 infinity cases, um, but the whole, the whole approach is rather different, so that's subject of a different talk. Um, and lastly, uh, some of the references and um, and uh, thank you, thank you very much. Yes, uh, that, um, in fact, that, that's, that's the approach that Ullman took, and um, uh, so there is, uh, um, there is, uh, well, that's the same quantity in finite dimensions, uh, but in, in, in von Neumann algebras, it's not necessarily, uh, uh, it doesn't correspond uh, exactly to, to Joseph's definition. So Joseph's definition actually uh, uh, really works best in, in the uh, setting of finite von Neumann algebra. So in the semi-finite case, there's some significant differences. Um, so we didn't actually uh, pursue that, that line of thinking. We have a, we have a uh, geometric of channels that matches this. Right. Yeah. Uh, so maps of order zero. Um, so uh, if you're talking about completely positive maps of order zero, um, then uh, they will always look like um, they'll look like a composition of a multiplication operator by something in the center times a homomorphism, um, and actually that's a that's a theorem of uh, uh, Winter and Zacharias um, for completely positive maps. Uh, when you reduce the level of positivity, I'm not entirely sure. So if you just, if, uh, so of course a unital, a unital completely positive map will um, satisfy the Schwartz inequality, uh, but if you go to something that doesn't satisfy the Schwartz inequality, I, I, I don't know. <laughs>